What's going on? Welcome to ednews.com. It's your host, EJ Carrion, and today we have an awesome guest, Simon Rodberg, founding principal uh, of DCI Schools and author of What If I'm Wrong, which is also supported and published by ASCD. Really been looking forward to this because he has an article out uh, on EdSearch around uh, teacher flexibility. So, Simon, welcome to the show. So happy to be here. I'm excited to talk about this important stuff. We're happy to have you. So um, let's just dive in on just give us the macro of what you feel like needs to be the sounding alarm conversation around uh, your article and, and what you're thinking about. Yeah, so, you know, we've been talking about teacher shortages in this country for a long time, and they're real, um, but I am very fearful that they are about to get way worse. Um, what people call the great resignation or the big quit hasn't yet come for teaching, um, but I think at the end of the school year, we are going to see a massive turnover in teachers without new folks to hire, if in particular, teachers don't see a way to have much more flexibility in their work lives. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing these days in workers generally, um, that partly because of the experience of the last couple of years, people see both the need and opportunity to do some remote work, to do some flex time, to have a lot more control over what their work week looks like. And of course, teachers traditionally have no control over what their work week looks like. And I think we are going to lose them to other professions if we don't figure out how to make that possible within the context of real in-person school for kids, which I think is the other thing that we need to make sure happens. Yeah. And um, what is your kind of like take why, um, why is it maybe like what needs to happen? Because we've seen, you know, billion dollar organizations being able to shift and, and accept the demand of work from home uh, for a lot of their staff uh, from Google to Facebook to, uh, to Citibank what 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 is kind of the call to action that a principal or a superintendent or a designer of schools need to be thinking about as they look post pandemic? Well, look, it would be easy to say that teachers can work from home two days a week if kids do Zoom school two days a week. Mm. Unfortunately, we know that that doesn't work well for kids and it doesn't work well for parents. So the real challenge is how do we organize a school schedule such that kids can be there in person five days a week, but every teacher doesn't have to be. And I want to include folks beyond teachers so that counselors, so that receptionists, so that principals don't have to be either. And that takes some real rethinking because our model of school that we've had for a long, long time is that elementary school kids have one teacher and they have that teacher pretty much all day, pretty much all week. And high school kids have a set of teachers who they see once a day, five days a week. Um, we have that model. And if you keep that model up, then something's got to give on either end. But if we can change that model, if we can say education of our young people doesn't require the same group of adults every day, then we can make it possible for kids to be where they need to be five days a week, but for adults can uh, to do other things that they need to do sometimes during work hours as well. Yeah. Um, what is So what is your take? I know a lot of the article is around teacher flexibility. Do you see a need for students to be in five days a week if, you know, we're talking high school and how that can maybe lend some, I think, because a lot of students want that flexibility or are seeking that flexibility as well. Absolutely. Um, I think that when possible, in-person is better than remote. That said, there are some good possibilities for remote, right? If you're at a small school that doesn't offer a particular AP class um, or you want to be able to take college classes online, I think that there can be some great opportunities there. I also think that internships, community service, work in the community um, can re be really educational and useful for students. And if they're doing that one day a week, one and a half days a week, I mm -hmm. think that can be a great opportunity to then match that up with adult scheduling. Um, certainly in my experience, and I've supervised students doing internships, like they don't do that well and their workplace, their internship uh, placements don't mm -hmm. do that well if they're just sent off by themselves. They need adults checking in with them, doing some visits, making sure that things are fine for the student in their workplace and fine with the workplace about the student. Um, but that's a different kind of work and a different kind of scheduling. And I certainly think for high school students, uh, there can be a place for that in this solution, which I think will better educate students, um, better prepare them for their coming lives with that real world experience, and also be one way that we can find additional flexibility for the adults who work in schools. Yeah, in, in the article, you kind of talked about um, the supply and demand is coming where we truly won't have enough people coming into the profession um, to keep up 
uh, the capacity that we look for. Do you have any kind of um, like new data or data that kind of shows when that possibly could be um, where it's going to break? Yeah. So the first thing I would say is it's already broken in some areas, um, just that we've managed to fill uh, those spots with adult human beings in the past. So it's already broken, for instance, in math and science. There are not enough qualified math and science mm -hmm. teachers in our schools. Why is that? Well, because people with math and science degrees have a lot of other opportunities um, with higher pay, more flexibility, et cetera. Um, I think that is coming more to other subjects as well because the uh, desire of college graduates generally for flexible work um, is, uh, is high. And th honestly, the unemployment rate is low. And whenever the unemployment rate is low, it's harder to find teachers. Um, I've also seen some interesting data uh, from DC just this this week, um, that in the last year before the pandemic, um, we had about 16% turnover in DC schools. Um, we've had actually much lower uh, turnover during the pandemic. I think people are risk averse. Um, people feel like it's not a good time to try to go somewhere new when everything is so up in the air. So we've bound, been down to 11 or 12% the last two years. What that says to me, which is really scary, is that there's about a 10% pent up natural turnover or previous turnover. I don't want to say natural because I think mm -hmm. that it can be uh, combated um, and uh, folks can be induced to stay in the profession. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a 30% turnover at the end of this year um, in DC and in many other cities. And that's really scary because there are not 30% new teachers out there waiting to take these jobs. They see what's going on in schools. They see the stress that teachers are under. Um, you know, you just have to talk to teachers or look at teacher Twitter to see uh, the people are saying, this is the hardest it's ever been. When people are saying this is the hardest it's ever been, that's not a time that young people or career switchers say, let me at that. Yeah. Um... Can you kind of walk through your your pitch on the scheduling that you kind of shared in the article and how you can see that being sustainable um, uh, for, for, for school leaders? Sure. So I think we have to start with the question of what would we do if we only had any given individual in the building four days a week, any given adult. Mm -hmm. If any given teacher was in the building four days a week um, and working from home, catching up on grading, planning, getting a doctor's appointment, getting to go to a, you know, a, a yoga or fitness class in the middle of the day, um, getting to spend some extra time with their kids or with their adult parents uh, in the middle of the day. Um, if we took that as a given and we took kids at school five days a week, or at least being educated under the auspices of school five days a week. If we had those two things, how could we make it line up? I think the answers are really different for every school and different for different ages of kids. So we've already talked about internships and community service experiences for high school kids. If they did that one day a week, and especially if it were not the same day for all kids, not every Friday, every kid, um, we could set up schedules so that uh, they had their academic classes meet four days a week. Any given teacher's academic classes would meet four days a week. And then there were some adults who spent some of their time supervising those internships on the fifth day week. You could also get community organizations to come into the school um, to do activities one day a week, maybe for younger high school students, middle school students, and elementary school students. I think you can do creative things with what we call specials typically in elementary school. So instead of having you know, an art class five days a week and a PE class five days a week or an art three days and PE two days, you could back that up uh, next to each other one day. So you have a three hour arts workshop one day a week and a two hour, three hour field day kind of experience one day a week for a class of kids. And that, that group of kids, second grade teacher, isn't even in school that uh, one day a week. I think that's thinkable. I think parents would be fine with that. I think that the kids would have good experiences with that. It's a different way of working the school. But I think if we say, you know what, you have to figure it out to allow teachers more time flexibility, and you have to figure it out to get kids at school five days a week, there are ways to do it. It just requires creative thinking like that. Um, the one other thing I'll say is that I think that class size may, may need to change. Um, you know, we have this idea uh, that class size is what it is. But in fact, it varies widely across the country. Many private schools have class sizes of 15. The school where I was principal has an average class size of 19. There are school systems that have average class size of 33, right? There are wide variations across the country. And we could think about a system where, for instance, instead of currently having three classes with three teachers, whether that's a set of second grade or a set of high school English, you have three classes, you have two classes with three teachers. You increase class size, but some days a week, all three teachers are with those classes. And some days a week, there's only two teachers in the building and the third teacher has their sort of home rotation. Um, I think these things are thinkable and 
they will require some suffering um, to get there. I think they can be just as good once we're there. Um, but I think the trade-off really is, are we going to have enough teachers this fall to staff our schools? Yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned uh, the that you had some ideas around substitute teaching and just, I know it's not just the shortage, but the concept of it as well. What was, what was that kind of chewing in, uh, in your mind? Yeah, you know, we're seeing a, uh, a national sort of catastrophe already in substitute teaching. Um, and one thing that's happening is that that's creating more stress on teachers and other school staff because they're having to cover each other's classes. So mm -hmm. we've heard, you know, the National Guard uh, in some states has become a substitute teacher. The governor of New Mexico just got her substitute teacher license uh, so she could do her part in addressing this shortage. And it was occurring to me that substitute teachers, including those who have you know been doing it for a long time, um, I've, I've known many who are great with kids. I've known some who like really know their subject. But if you think about it, it's a really odd idea. You know, when somebody, when Joe at the office is sick, we don't call in somebody from the street who doesn't work at the office to come do it. We sort of shift Joe's responsibilities around. If a police officer is sick, we don't grab somebody as a substitute police officer. There is enough flexibility built into most systems that one person's absence doesn't mean we just get somebody who doesn't even work there to do the job for the day. It's a really odd idea when you think about it, um, especially for what we think of as highly skilled jobs. You know, if I'm if I'm going into the hospital for a surgery and a nurse is sick that day, it's another nurse. It's not somebody who's not a nurse coming in to be the nurse that day, and it's not somebody who was a nurse at some other school, at some other hospital the day before, it's going to be somebody who knows that hospital, knows its systems. We need to figure out how to build enough flexibility into the structures of school and school staffing that it is possible to say it's not a crisis when somebody is out. It's actually something we can plan for, we can deal with, and that we can continue kids' education the way we believe in it, not just patch things together to get through the day. Yeah. Well, what um, you kind of What's kind of the worst case scenario, uh, I guess, if that you're seeing, you know, if you had a billboard and you needed to just like get people activated to wake up, what would that kind of billboard say? Um, you know, kind of the, the, the end of the world kind of phrase that you would, you would kind of have for people around teaching. Yeah, the, the billboard would actually look like some of what we've seen this month. Um, and not because of COVID or Omicron, you know, who knows what will happen with COVID this fall, but I'm not talking about a COVID scenario, but we've actually seen it with Omicron, where there are not enough teachers to staff schools, but schools are open. And so we've got 100 kids in the auditorium, we've got teachers without a planning or a lunch period because they have to cover throughout the day, we've got principals and assistant principals who can't do their job because they have to cover throughout the day. So we have, you know, hundreds of kids in a school, and just not enough teachers to maintain anything like what we expect that school to look like. And my worst case scenario is that this fall, t schools are desperately hiring anybody that they can get their hands on, whether or not they have content expertise, whether or not they have any teacher background or, or training. And even so, they don't get enough people. So we have kids sitting on auditoriums because they don't have teachers. We have principals being substitute teachers because we don't have teachers. And we have everybody in the school building stressed. So we get into the vicious cycle that I think we're starting now, where where people are doing more than the work that they should be doing. So more people are quitting and getting sick. So more people are doing the work they shouldn't be doing. And even more people are quitting and getting sick. My billboard is what it has looked like this January in many schools. Well, I appreciate you kind of jumping in and sharing uh, some insight and just uh, talking about this. Uh, what, what kind of last question is, have you seen changes happening? What are some call to actions that you're asking from ed leaders uh, across the country? Yeah, you know, I just um, sounded, uh, gave a, you know, painted a really terrible picture. And I intend that as the wake up call, as the billboard that we have to change, as you said. But I am also seeing signs for hope because I think a lot of people out there, a lot of leaders, and I include teacher leaders, district leaders, thought leaders, principals, think that we do need to change the ways that we organize school currently so that it is more flexible, so that it includes more outside of school experience, more community involvement, more real world connections. Um, and I think that this can be an opportunity to really do some rethinking of how we get those things in while at the same time uh, making teachers' lives more doable. Um, and so I've seen people really thinking, you know, let's try something new. This is forcing us to, but it also allows us to think, well, what's actually best for kids? What do we believe in about education? If we have a broken system, how can we build back something better? Love it. Well, thank you so much, Simon, for joining us on ednews.com. You've been a great guest and looking forward to staying in touch and uh, seeing how this all plays out.
Thank you. Appreciate it, Ajay. Thanks for the work you do. And thank you so much to all the teachers out there. As hard as it is, stay with it. Absolutely.